Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grace Gathering Online. My name is Zeg Zeno. I'm so glad that you guys are joining us today as we gather together to worship virtually. Uh, before we jump into our worship and our service, uh, I do have just one announcement for you. Uh, and that's we want to ask you to be praying for our high school and middle school students who are on their summer trip right now. Currently, they are down in Lookout Mountain, Georgia, uh, and they are going to a Camp Generate where it is just an amazing time for them uh, to be together, to be in community, to be listening for God's voice and what he is speaking to them in their lives right now. Uh, so I just want to ask you if you would be praying for these students as they are on this trip. They got there Friday evening and they will be coming home on Tuesday. So they still have today and tomorrow uh, and the drive home. So we would love the, you, for you to be praying for them, for, for God to be speaking to them, uh, as well as for their safe travels home. Other than that, that's the only announcement I have. So let's go ahead and prepare our hearts for a time of worship together. Good morning, Grace Gathering. Uh, wherever you are, we encourage you to sit or stand, whatever posture of worship you want to be in. And we're just going to spend some time in worship together.
Don't give 
get enough I can't walk away I can't walk away For I have seen your face I can't walk I just wanna be where you are. I just wanna be near your heart. There is nothing like you now. There is nothing like you now.
Jesus. You are so worthy. We just worship you. We can't wait for your marriage supper, for the time that is to come, where we get to be with you forever, Lord. What a blessing, what an honor. Just pray that as we go into our time today, that our hearts would be set on you, that we'd be ready to enter into your courts of praise, listening to what you have for us, Lord, and we'd be open for what you want to do today, Lord. Hey, good morning, everyone. My name is Brian Menzi. I'm a part of the team here at Grace Gathering, and typically you'll find me and my family at our Grace Gathering North location. Well, this morning we get to hear from our good friend, Suze Fair. And as you can see, I'm right here on our online stage. Suze is going to be joining us remotely. And so I wanted to just welcome and introduce Suze to you this morning and just say that we are so excited to have her with us. Suze, why don't you go ahead and take it away? Well, thanks, Brian. And I'm glad to be with you virtually this morning or this afternoon or whenever it is you're watching this. Um, my name is Suze Fair and I'm part of the um, just team here at Grace. We, Kelly, my husband Kelly and I um, actually attend the Central site on um, with regularity call that our home base. Um, and we're just grateful to be a part of the Grace family. Well, this morning, um, or again, this afternoon, it's morning when I'm recording this, but today I just really um, was really excited when Pastor Brian asked me to just talk about um, good news. And I feel privileged to be invited to do so, to be with you to do so. And um Really, the best news I know to share with you today is just about you, and it's the amazingness that is you. And I know sometimes that's hard for us to remember, but it is true. And probably like many of you these days, my heart and mind are often filled with what's difficult in the world. The news seems to be a never-ending stream of pain. Um, Social media is like a feeding frenzy for the controversial and the divisive. And even if you don't take in any of that, it would be almost impossible to not see that the world is suffering. There's a war in Ukraine that doesn't seem to make any sense to anyone. And as of today, this ongoing um, uh, conflict has cost an estimated 10 to 14,000 folks their lives. Um, we are still feeling the impact of a worldwide pandemic that has had the kind of long-term fallout that none of us could have anticipated or even imagined two years ago. Over 1 million lives have been lost to COVID. 24,000 of those were Hoosiers. Families in huge disagreements. I hear stories all the time about families that can't can't agree about lots of things connected to COVID, like um, how their workplace is handling it. Should we wear a mask? Should we not? What about the vaccine? How long do we quarantine? All of those kinds of things. So far this year, we've already experienced 27 school shootings in America. We have miles to go in our quest for racial reconciliation. And the economy, um, let's get real, has us all on edge. There's plenty of heart-wrenching difficult. However, there is good news. This last week we had a, this is not good news, but this last week we had a plumbing issue at our house. The plumber came on Tuesday and fixed it. And then on Friday we had one of those, why do I hear water running at 5.30 in the morning moments? And when you know it, we had a room full of water when we got down there. Long story short, the plumber came back three times Nice guy, fixed the problem, different one than the first problem, cleaned up all the water, brought a huge fan and didn't charge us the thing. That night at dinner, as we were talking through it all, Kelly and I looked at each other and almost ex exact same time said, you know, there are just still so many great people in the world. And there are. This spring, two graduating classes from two different colleges, one in California and one in Texas, 
received the news as they were getting their diplomas that all of their student debt had been wiped out by an alumni. That, that's pretty amazing. In Phoenix, a gas station owner decided he was gonna start selling gas 50 cents cheaper than the price he had been told to charge to make his regular profit. When he was asked why, he just shrugged and said, you know, it, life is hard right now and this is just a way I can help my, my customers. In Massachusetts, a DoorDash driver thought she was just delivering a pizza, but when she got to her destination, she found a woman in the driveway unconscious. Scary. So instead of just dropping off the pepperoni with extra cheese, she called 911, performed CPR, and saved the woman's life. It, we found out later she was a former EMT. In Flint, Michigan, there's a church that has added a laundry facility uh, in their basement because 75% of their neighbors are renters who rely on public transit to get around, and the nearest laundromat is four miles away. And life's just too hard for that. And the list could go on and on. I bet if you think for a minute, you would be able to remember a time recently when you said, oh man, there's just so many good people in the world. Somebody did something kind for you or they were unexpectedly <laughs> generous. Um, I don't know about you, but if there's a list somewhere with columns for good people on the right-hand side and not so good people on the left-hand side, I want to be counted on that right-hand side. I, I want to be the person that sparks that, that um, table conversation that says, man, there's just good people. And here's the deal. If you are a Jesus person, you're already in that good people column. Now, I'm not saying we always act like we belong over there, but we do, and we are. And you know how I know? Because the really, really good guidebook for our life called the Bible, tells us that you and I were made in the likeness of God himself. And everywhere we go, we carry around his being, his presence, his goodness. We, we take that with us. So we are the good guys. In his second letter to the church in Corinth, Paul had just returned to Ephesus after visiting the believers in Corinth. And he's concerned. Uh, Paul writes from a really vulnerable place in his own life. His health wasn't great when he was with them. And it seems that some uh, folks in the church may have misinterpreted his physical weakness for a weakness in his faith and his leadership. So Paul writes the second letter to them, and he's talking to them about what he observed, which was a lot of quarreling and disunity. And he also decides he needs to do a little reminding. Actually, the whole letter, the second one, is a reminder. Paul is saying, look, don't forget who I am. Don't forget who you are. And most of all, don't forget who God is. In chapter two, Paul says this, for we are to God, the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one, we are an aroma that brings death to the other, an aroma that brings life. We carry this around with us all the time. And then in chapter three, he says, are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or, or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. You yourself are the letter. And what a letter it is. Your life, my life. They tell the story of life and death and resurrection and joy, sometimes all at the same time, and always in a hundred different ways. Today, I wanna to remind you that the story of you is a really good one, written with tender, loving care and with the ending already in mind. And it's a really good ending. In turn, every story, yours, mine, my family's, your family's, the church, our church, every story matters and is connected to the story, the big one 
the one that has been in process of being written since the very beginning of time. Did you know that when a writer sits down to pen an epic tale like Lord of the Rings, um, whether it's a tale of adventure or victory or even a love story, that there's a basic formula that they're following. In literary terms, it's called the monomyth, or in terms you and I would understand, it's just called the hero's journey. In some literary formats, there are as many as 17 stages. The basic three are always the same. There's a departure. This is when the hero leaves the familiar world behind. There's the initiation. The hero learns to navigate the unfamiliar world. And then there's the return. The hero returns to the familiar world. Now, I want to read some of the more details of these to you and see if you recognize any of it. So in the departure, there's a call to adventure. Something or someone interrupts the hero's familiar life to present a problem, a threat, or an opportunity. And then that hero refuses the call. There's, it's called the refusal of the call. He's un, he or she is unwilling to step out of their comfort zone or face their fear. The hero initially hesitates, but then they do embark on the journey. The third step is supernatural aid. A mentor figure gives the hero the tools and inspiration he or she needs to accept the call to adventure. The fourth step is crossing the threshold. The hero then embarks on their quest. And the fifth in stage in this departure is the belly, is called the belly of the whale. The hero crosses the point of no return and encounters their first major obstacle. In the second stage, which is initiation, the, it's, the first step is the road of trials. The hero must go through a series of tests or ordeals to begin his or her transformation. Often, the hero fails at at least one of these tests. The seventh step is the meeting with the goddess, which is really just the hero meets one or more of their allies who pick him up or her up and help continue on the journey. The eighth step is the temptation. The hero is tempted to abandon or stray from the quest. Yeah, and then there's atonement with the father. The hero confronts the reason for his journey, facing his doubts and fears and the powers that rule his life. This is a major turning point in the story. Every prior step has brought the hero here to atonement with the father and every step forward stems from this moment. The 10th the step is culmination. As a result of this confrontation, the hero gains a profound understanding of their purpose or skill and armed with this new understanding, they prepare for the most difficult part of the adventure. And then the 11th step is the ultimate boon. The hero achieves the goal uh, she set out to accomplish, fulfilling the call that inspired the journey in the first place. And then this last stage is the return. And um, in literary terms, the, there's a refusal of the return. Often in, a, in the stories we read or we watch, there's a refusal of the return. If the hero's journey has been victorious, he may be reluctant to return to the ordinary world. Then there's a stage called the magic flight. The hero must escape with the object of his quest, evading those who might reclaim it. And then there's a rescue from without, mirroring, mirroring the meeting with the ally. The hero receives help from a guide. And then the 15th step is the crossing of the return threshold. The hero makes a successful return to the ordinary world. And the second to the last step is the hero becomes the master of two worlds. We see the hero achieve a balance between who he was and who he is now. And um, the last stage is the freedom to live. We leave the hero at peace. And I know that was a lot, but do you recognize any of those steps, any of those stages? Like I get, when I read that, I get so emotional. This formula was written by a man who, as far as we know, had no relationship with God or Jesus. But remember, all truth is God's truth. So if there's anything that sounded familiar, it's because there's only ever been one epic story of adventure and victory that leads to freedom. And it's not Star Wars or Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter or Stranger Things. 
even though we love many of those stories and they all fit this formula. No, this is the story of God himself and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. We, we don't have to be the hero of our lives because we already have one. And he has gone on the ultimate quest to set us free from whatever it is that's keeping us from trusting that the story being written in and on our lives, this letter that we are, this letter that's being, that Paul is alluding to, that's being written in our life is a great one. But sometimes we have a hard time trusting that, that it's a good letter. I do. <laughs> I mean, I do. And I don't know if you do, but I see, I think that's kind of normal. No matter what might be happening in your story right now, I just want to remind you and myself, there hasn't been a moment when God has looked at us and looked at our circumstances and the things we're going through and thought, hmm, I wonder that, how that's going to turn out for Suze. That's not God. It, are our lives perfect? Is my life perfect? No, that is not a thing. But the lives we're living are really good ones, even with the difficulties that are happening. And our lives have a purpose, a really, really beautiful, glorious purpose. And again, in his letter, uh, his second letter to those Corinthians in chapter four, Paul reminds them and us about this purpose. He says it like this, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. This letter that we are is because of the goodness of God. And because God is good, the letter is good. Over and over, Paul is reminding his reader that it's not about what's happening out there in the world. It's, it's about what's already happened in here, in you, in me. These lives we're living, they're not just get up, eat, get ourselves and the kids ready, go to work, go to school, eat, learn some stuff, get some projects done, work some more, come home, eat again watch the latest binge-worthy show on Netflix, have a snack, go to bed, all to get up and do it again tomorrow. These are not our lives, even though sometimes we do those things in our lives. No, these lives are treasures created with a glorious and specific purpose that's all yours. It, your purpose is not mine. I have one, you have one. We all do. Our oldest child, Benjamin, is adopted. We found out he would join our family just six weeks before he was born. And then he came to live with us after spending his first six weeks of life in foster care. The woman who carried him against great odds, we would found out, find out later, um, man, she had a hard life, really hard life. And before I even knew that, she was my hero. She's been my hero since the first day. I learned of her. Whether she was going to choose us or not, I thought deciding to carry this baby to term as a 36-year-old woman who already had children from a previous marriage, I, I just thought she was incredibly brave. Later, my admiration and love for her would only grow. 26 years after Sharon, that's, that's her name, 26 years after Sharon gave birth to Ben, we met five of her first six children. They had found us through a cousin of theirs who was a friend of mine. And our family of five, um, Kelly and I, Ben and his two sisters, 
went to Chicago and spent what would be an amazing afternoon with these dear people that we now affectionately call the BioSibs. We shared stories that day that filled in gaps for the five of them and for Benjamin and for us. And they told us about their mother. There's a picture here of uh, the five of them and Benjamin and then his um, sisters that he grew up with. These um, bio sibs that we love so dearly told us about their anger through their parents' divorce, their confusion when their mom was pregnant and she didn't live with them or their dad anymore. They were, they were just kids at the time. They told us about the stroke that she encountered uh, that happened to her, that it happened years after Benjamin was born, but it caused her physical and mental impairments. And then she had another stroke that led to her needing full-time care. These kids who were not kids when we met them, they were grown people married with children of her own. They shared the tender story of each of them caring for her and then eventually making the really difficult decision to entrust her care to her nursing home. We heard their pain as they shared with us about her confinement first in a wheelchair and then her bed and how in the last couple of years of her life, she was unable to speak. They also told us though, all of that, through, through it all, she never stopped loving the Lord and encourage, e encouraging each of them to do the same. And that she never stopped thinking about Benjamin. When people would ask her how many kids she had, she would say seven. And thinking that it was her mental impairment talking, they would correct her and say, oh, no, Sharon, you, you, you have six children. And she would respond, you're forgetting about Benjamin. She had in her Bible the picture of Ben I sent her on his first birthday. I never knew if she got any of my letters or the pictures. So that day when the, her, her kids showed us this, it was, um, it was amazing. And we have a picture of Sharon to share with you here. This was a woman almost everyone, but her six biological children would set aside, mostly because her jar of clay was broken and not functioning at the culturally acceptable levels. I mean, what could someone living in a nursing home confined to a wheelchair and later in her bed and unable to speak, what could that person contribute to the world? Well, if you ask her seven children and you ask us, we would tell you she contributed a lot to the world. Sharon died on Christmas Eve, 2017. For 25 years, she prayed for Ben every day. I don't know all the things she prayed for, probably very similar things as I was praying for as I was raising him, that he would be healthy, that he would come to know, know the Lord in an early age, that he would give and receive love, and I know she was praying that she could meet him someday. All the things she prayed for, his health, his loving the Lord, giving and receiving love, all of that is true. And someday they will meet each other, just not on this side of heaven. Sharon was convinced, and me too, that her heart, her life, her understanding of the good news was the best kind of letter that anyone could ever receive. And she had so many in her life, some she would never meet, like you. Who would read it? I don't know where God has placed you. Whatever family you're in or neighborhood you live in, wherever you're working, the gym you go to or the coffee shop you frequent, all of these places are filled with people who are desperate for them, not for you, for them, for God, for Jesus, for the Holy Spirit. That's what the world is desperate for. Whatever good news God has given you, it has been written on your life and someone beyond you needs it. If you're not sure what it is, that's okay. I would encourage you to take a look at the story that is yours. This hero, not you, the hero that went on a great quest has written a story on your life. And I bet if you look at it, 
you can find God in it. And when you do, I'm going to encourage you to write it down. Not just so you can remember, but so you can tell someone who needs to hear about it. So it's things like this, like, have you been ill and now you're not? That was God. Has your bank account ever been lower than what you need to pay your bills? And yet those bills still get paid. That was God. Have you had a relationship break or end or just disappear and you thought you would do the same break or end or disappear and you didn't? That was God. When was the last time your fear was great and yet you couldn't deny the peace that was present and you got through the day, the moment, the year? That was all God. Our lives are God's love letter to the world. Who has been reading yours? I'll close today with just a couple questions. And they're kind of the questions, I mean, Paul doesn't say them exactly this way, but they're the questions that came to me after I read this letter, this second letter. Where has God been saying yes to you? What's the best way for you to remember that? Write it down, tell a friend, pray it through. Who needs to hear the story of you and God and the letter that is your life? Who needs to read it? Who needs to sit with it? Who do you, who do you need to tell? This week, not sometime way down the road, but this week. I'm so glad to get to do part of this journey with you and to read some of your letters. They're amazing. I mean, like your hearts and your lives, you share them with me and they're amazing. And uh, there's a world that needs us to let them read our letter. Let me pray for us. God, I thank you. I thank you for um, how much you love us. I thank you for how much you're willing to go ahead of us, stand behind us, and be right beside us no matter what is happening because you've entrusted us with the best news there is. This life of your son that was so big and wonderful and life-changing, his death and then resurrection that changed everything. Lord, we thank you and we pray for insight and wisdom into our own story this week. And we pray that you would create opportunities where we could share the good news that is you and us um, and the ways that you've been writing your love on our life. Amen. Have a great week.